The concept of a film being mismarketed should be nothing new to those of you who follow me on a regular basis. Many times I've talked before how even a slightly wrong advertising campaign can completely and utterly destroy a film's chance for success, not to mention really hurt its critical reception. Recent examples like Scott Pilgrim, Hugo and the Lone Ranger all demonstrating what has happened when, well, the studio doesn't know how to sell the film quite so they end up putting it under one category. Like how Hugo, instead of being sold as a love letter to old cinema, was instead made into this quasi Narnia knockoff railway children-y kind of thing. It's a bit of a mess to say the least. And of course Scott Pilgrim was sold as possibly the dumbest movie ever made, even though in reality the film is far better than that. But sometimes a film can be mismarketed not because it is difficult to really summarize, even though to be fair the spirit isn't exactly something that's cut and dry, but because of the people involved, in this case Frank Miller, who was best known to audiences for Sin City, and even though he didn't direct it, he was the creator of 300. His particular brand of filmmaking, focusing primarily on a lot of dark, serious, edgy material with that very distinctive black and white art style, probably led a lot of people to think that the spirit was going to be more of the same. Dark, gritty, hard-hitting crime drama with a hero who existed somewhere between our world and the afterlife. Of course, the things turned out very different, and well, the film was a complete disaster commercially and critically. The reason I bring up all this background is because I feel it best clarifies what I feel about the spirit. The film is very much not, and I wish to emphasize, not like Sin City. This isn't hard-hitting crime drama, this isn't a sprawling, multi-strand tale of different people. In fact, if I could summarize it as anything, well, this is Frank Miller's Looney Tunes. This is simply put absurdist farce taken to the extreme with no one really holding Frank back. We get exaggerated over the top sight gags, almost cartoonish battles between the spirit and the octopus, a lot of really bizarre gags and references here and there such as Star Trek is Dead which was frankly a lot more relevant in 2008 than now, even though some fans are, well, have not been particularly happy with Into Darkness, and things like having all the henchmen's names end in things like Os, like Pathos and the final gag being Adios Amigos, and even really, really strange things that came out of nowhere like the octopus's constant references to eggs. All of this is deliberately playing up on both Frank's sense of humor, as well as satirizing a lot of the absurd nature within the comic book medium. The stylized look that is Frank's trademark and then the actual writing of the film are frankly completely at odds with each other. One is dark and stylized, the other is goofy, silly to the extreme without anything holding it back. The weird thing is, though, before I start seeing a lot of later reviews that brought up the film's cartoonish nature and style of humor, I was already aware that something was a little bit off. I remember one time going to get my hair cut around uh, 2008, maybe late 2007, and reading an article in Empire about the film. And well, in big bold letters, during one of the interviews with the actors, I believe it was Gabriel Markt, he referred to the fact that the film was very much like Looney Tunes and made references to fight scenes involving sinks and giant wrenches. At the time I was a little perplexed, thinking, well, isn't this supposed to be more of that gritty hard stuff? Why is he talking about things that sound like they belong in Tom and Jerry? Well, turns out he was right. This doesn't mean that the film's entire cahoon of problems is completely vindicated, but it certainly gives a lot of context. A lot of stuff in this film is deliberately designed not to make sense or to be absurd because it's poking fun at a lot of the, well, frankly, absurdities within both comic books and their adaptations. I mean, think about it. The almost cartoonish fights come from, well, a lot of the absurd physics in a lot of superhero battles. The Mary Sue nature of the character's powers very much fits in with a lot of the throwaway superheroes that are, well, being created on a constant basis then and now. The extreme stylization may be commentary on the fact that a lot of superhero films, at least then, tended to place 
a lot more stock on their style, action and visual appeal than anything really intellectually stimulating. Gabriel Marx attempting an almost Bale-esque growl to his voice and maintaining an absolutely straight face while all this crazy stuff is going on around him. There's a lot of surprisingly clever stuff going on here. But I do understand why a lot of people simply couldn't get on board. And there is a lot of very insidey comic book stuff here that the popular audience, well, wouldn't get. And in particular, things like the eggs joke, you would only really understand if you knew the production of the film. It wasn't anything to do with any sort of symbolism about cloning or science, since the octopus is a mad scientist here. But instead, because Frank Miller simply thought the eggs were funny. No, I'm not making that up. Furthermore, it's not just the way Frank writes and directs that makes me think that this is very much in line more of pastiche and satire than anything that's deliberately meant to be taken straight. It's also down to a couple of other things. For one, David Newman's score very much feels like it's riffing on a lot of the kind of music that guys like Hans Zimmer and Danny Elfman were making for these films. In particular, there are a couple of cues that really sound similar to Danny Elfman's music from the first two Tim Burton Batman films. It's taking on that more ap operatic, bombastic quality as opposed to the harder edge that Zimmer and Newton Howard gave their scores. Plus, all of the actors here seem fully aware of the fact that they're playing archetypes here, especially Samuel Jackson, who is effectively playing a more exaggerated version of himself, which to be fair, has already been pretty exaggerated by popular culture, and he is just hamming it up to high heaven. And let's face it, how can you not get a laugh out of seeing Sam Jackson in a Nazi costume blathering on about God and science and all sorts of ridiculous speeches, and then partway through getting interrupted by a telephone call, a joke that I imagine worked a lot better in theaters. It's stuff like that that brings a smile to my face and makes me give the film a lot more points than probably I would have had I not known this stuff going in. Now, of course, the fact that it is attempting this kind of stylized satire doesn't automatically excuse all any or all of the film's problems, which it does have, since sometimes, even for what is supposed to be a pastiche of all the silly conventions within the genre, sometimes the film's narrative stretches itself a bit too thin, and some scenes are played a little too straight to the point where they lose their humorous or satirical edge. This applies to a couple of scenes such as the flashbacks to young Denny Colt, the spirit, and his girlfriend when they were growing up. Here it's played a little bit too straight for the film's more humorous inclination. Or a later scene where one of the spirit's love interests starts talking with her father about, well, the nature of the situation. This scene is played, again, really, really strange. doesn't really seem to have much of an ironic or humorous edge to it. Perhaps it's meant to be talking about sometimes the absurd nature of relationships and how very often there's very little personal insight. But again, this is one of those times where I think Miller perhaps didn't quite get the balance right. And really, balance is the key issue here. Mainly, how much of this is accessible to a general audience and how much of this is Frank making a movie for himself and comic book aficionados. Since every joke, as I mentioned, is stuff that you would really have to know Frank's work or know the production to really get. And while the general rule of thumb is to make a film as accessible for a broad audience as possible, and generally speaking with adaptations, they especially live by this, there's just something about this one that makes me let the rules slide a bit on a subjective level. On an objective level, yeah, it doesn't really work, but I don't know, I'm kind of fine with that in a very strange way, and this is one of the few films where I can say that. For those who have never seen the film because of its negative reception, Go in, but don't go in the way a lot of people did. This isn't Sin City. Go in expecting something more like Frank Miller's Looney Tunes, and I think you will get quite a bit out of it. Not every single joke will work for every single person. A lot of it will depend on your comic book knowledge. But I feel that, for those who know, The Spirit is a pretty rewarding trip.